Okay, welcome back, everybody. We are live right now in the Rosenbaum trial. The foster parents accused of the killing their two-year-old daughter, the foster daughter, Layla. Very difficult case. And on the stand right now is the biological mother of this two-year-old. And she's discussing how she lost custody of her daughters, how they moved from place to place. Uh, they were in the care of all different kinds of individuals. And then they move to this foster home. She talks about how they were with a family called the Browns. Let's pick it up there. We're about to go live. Well, we're certainly getting a very disturbing account of how the system works. Um, you know, these kids were passed around from place to place, and they grew up in a household where their mother uh, was, you know, had problems with the law and drugs. And she eventually, these kids are eventually in the care of the Rosenbounds, and they're only in the care for a few months before everything happens. What do you make of all this? It's interesting listening to her on the stand because at first you think the Rosenbaums are going to be great. Yeah. They reached out to the mother. They seem to have great jobs. And for the first time, the mother actually felt comfortable because like you said, the children had been bounced around. So it's interesting, the witness is a prosecution witness, but she's making a good case so far for the Rosenbaums. Is the defense trying to say at some point, look, these kids were uh, really roughhousing a lot. I mean, let's look at their past. Let's look at what they were doing. They shown signs of aggression and that they go to the stable home. And unfortunately, it doesn't matter who had the custody of these children. This would have happened no matter what. Is that what they're trying to say? It, it does look like that. I think they're trying to say that the Rosenbaums were a great family and that these injuries were not the result of anything that Jennifer did to the children. Yeah, I mean, it does seem out of character based on everything we've seen. However, these injuries and what ultimately happened to Layla, it's going to be very hard for the defense to explain away. Let's go back live. Okay, so this is interesting. We're learning more about, the, I guess, the communications between Jennifer Rosenbaum and uh, Tessa Daniel about Layla. They're talking about the broken leg, but there seems to be sometimes information that's lacking or something seems a little strange in terms of the visits and then all of a sudden she gets injured or sick. I mean, what do you make of this? I think the prosecution is trying to show here that the injuries are not normal injuries, that they're not gymnastics. It's something that the Rosenbaums are not telling the birth mother. So, you know, at first glance, it looks like these are all normal issues. But, you know, I think the prosecution is trying to say that it's not normal and that the foster parent is not telling you everything you need to know. How do we know? I mean, it's, it seems to be so much about Jennifer Rosenbaum, uh, who's actually a product of the foster care system herself. How are they going to attach it to the husband? I mean, it's all about her right now. So far, but I think they will show that there was neglect at least and that he was involved because he was there and he could have stopped whatever abuse might have been happening. Or is it the situation that if you have one parent who's abusing, well, you group them together because they're both responsible? I mean, is that the way the law works? I think the prosecution is absolutely looking at it like that here. And yes, they can both be held responsible, particularly if they are both present at the time that the child dies. The law is going to impose the criminality on the other person as well. Now, we we're seeing this uh, testimony from Tessa Daniel. What is the defense going to do when they have an opportunity to cross-examine her? Because again, a sensitive witness here, but important nonetheless. What are they going to say? What are they going to try to get information out of her for? Well, I think the defense is going to try to show, one, that she's not very clear on her timeline. Sure. And she doesn't remember a lot. And by her own words, the birth mother seems to think that, at least initially, Jennifer was taking good care of right. Layla and Millie. So I think the defense is going to try to show more of that, that the you know defendants were not abusing or mistreating the children. I still want to get back to the defense here, because the idea of the, the, the real big thing that they looked at was, well, you're saying that this young girl choked on a piece of chicken, but let's look at these internal injuries here, uh, and there's severe trauma to the, to the abdomen. Now, the defense is going to be saying these are, this is the efforts that Jennifer tried to do to resuscitate uh, Layla. How can we distinguish between the two? And if I'm sitting on this jury and I don't have a clear timeline of, well, I, I don't know, unless, unless there's experts who come on and say it's impossible these injuries are a result of life-saving efforts, you tell me. You raise a good point. I think there is reasonable doubt here from what I've heard. When I first heard the opening from the prosecution, I thought, 
that's it. These two defendants are going down. Right. But now, there seems to be some doubt as to how these injuries were caused. Was it gymnastics or was it the Heimlich maneuver? If these girls had no injuries, they maybe they, looked, they were sick, maybe very minor injuries from fall, but if they had no significant injuries and then all of a sudden there's this, uh, the, the death of Layla, would we have been at trial right now? Would, would they have brought charges? I think that would be a much weaker case. I think they might have still brought charges just because it's the death of a child. But we certainly would have a very different case. Is it also because they're foster parents? Exactly. They're going to be looking more closely into that situation. When you have a situation where it's not your own birth child and there's any question at all, I think the state is going to say we have to look at this very carefully. Now, if they are ultimately convicted, isn't that a stain on the foster system and the government as well? Because it's a difference if you have a, a, a biological parents who are charged. Look, they no one put the custody no one told the no one gave those children to that that couple they those children were born here if the, this these parents are ultimately convicted isn't that a stain on the government and saying this is your fault absolutely and you see it across the country all of the time when these children's services are not investigating enough or they're not looking at what's happening with these children and taking it as seriously as they should. So absolutely, if they're convicted, it will look bad for the government. Yeah, okay, well, we have a long way to go, a lot to cover. We're gonna jump back live as soon as this recess is over. And again, we'll probably hear more from this biological mother, Tessa Daniel, and we are waiting to see what will happen under cross-examination. This is an important day, an emotional day. Stay tuned. We'll be right back right after this.